Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our next session of MPW Live. You're all very welcome this morning, wherever in the world you are. Thank you for joining us. And um, please do feel free to put yourself on mute uh, for the duration of the webinar. We'll be using the chat function for uh, any questions or comments that you have during the presentation and hope that we will have a chance to um, get to those questions at the end of the session today. Um, I am very pleased, in fact, looking at the background uh, where James and Matt are today, because I know they're back in the school and uh, MPW London, and that's great, great news. And uh, 8th of March, we opened, schools are open. We have a roadmap out of the lockdown, so we're Despite the rain and the grey start to the morning in London this morning, we're, we're feeling quite positive um, about the next few months. So, um, yeah, really pleased that you are part of the MPW journey this morning and you're joining us for this session. It will be recorded. I just saw that uh, message came up and we'll be sending it out to you um, shortly after the webinar today. So, uh, very pleased to uh, welcome James Barton, Director of Admissions, and Matt Carmody, Head of Faculty at MPW, um, presenting to us today for preparing for success, essential steps to winning a place at Oxbridge. So, I will be quiet from this point on, um, and I'll hand over to them and uh, maybe see you later for a Q&A. So, James and Matt, over to you. So. I, I, I do, and I, I, we'll get to the serious stuff in a moment, I promise you, but I do like the way you introduce MPW Live. It's almost as though you have good BBC training in terms of your, your billing before all of these things. I think you do it marvellously. Thank you um, so much. So. I've, I've lived overseas for so long, and I am, I am at heart an English language teacher, so I think I just kind of present naturally. My wife doesn't like it, but I, uh, you know, I just present whatever I'm doing all times. Well, I, well, well, we very much appreciate it because it keeps in the style of what we're about to do, which is obviously, um, if anything, last week was anything to go by as well, it's, it's less lecture, more talking heads, uh, I suppose, the whole thing. Far more conversation, so it means people can sit back with a coffee and watch TV as opposed yeah. to feeling too lectured at for the next sort of half hour, 40 minutes. But thank you very much. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Good. All right. I'll enjoy it. Thank you. Right, well, let us just move to the stage so I can put uh, the presentation on for you. Um, and hopefully that is there. Uh, right, yes, indeed. As Steve says, very, very good morning to you. Um, and today, obviously, we are talking about uh, success in the Oxford applications. Um, the, the, the theme, the format, let's, uh, let's start with that. Uh, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview, as I generally tend to do in terms of the process, uh, in terms of the histories behind the colleges and the sort of things you could be looking at uh, going there. And then a far more esteemed gentleman here on my right, uh, Dr. Matt Carmody, is going to give you more of a sense as to who the successful candidates are. And that really is the important crux of this presentation itself. But Oxbridge fascinates me. It fascinates everyone, really, because in general terms, if you ask anyone about university or education in the United Kingdom, they tend to uh, they tend to mention Oxbridge straight away. I read a, a really wonderful article. Uh, it was a while ago now, but it absolutely is true. It's, it's why is Oxford a lot like Hogwarts? And I think that kind of encapsulates in its own way um, what people actually view these rather prestigious universities to be like uh, in general, but it's it's based around their traditions as much as anything. And Matt, I don't know about you, you've actually been through the Oxbridge process, you've I been know. there, you've lived it, you've done it. Which college were you? I was at Queen's College, Cambridge. Queen's Cambridge. What were the traditions behind Queen's Cambridge? Do you remember them? Did like, you have to adhere to them? Uh, no, the one that was uh, told most often concerned the bridge. The, there's a little bridge over the river Cam there, uh -huh. known as the Mathematical Bridge, and the story, like so many stories, it wasn't true. Uh, was that the bridge was put together variously by uh, Erasmus or by Newton or by some famous person there, mm. uh, wholly without uh, screws or nails, like an interlocking bit of wood puzzle. Right. Um, and many years later, uh, the, the fellows at the college 
uh, wanted to know how this was done, so what they decided to do was take the bridge apart and put it back together again. And they took it apart and they realised they couldn't put it back together again. So when you cross over it now, it's full of nails and spars and other kinds of bits. Okay. Uh, sadly, uh, the story is almost certainly not true. But, so, so um, it is a complete lie. It is, it is, but, but um, that's part of the whole Wartian mystery. <laughs> there is a Wartian mystery, I love know, that. There, is, there are stories whose provenance and whose veracity you, you're not always in a position yeah. uh, to determine. I, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, some of them still hold a bit of uh, weight and a bit of truth. They, some of them I find deeply fascinating. Um, you know uh, how in this country uh, you have to be a royal if mm -hmm. you want to eat an unmuted swan. Yes. Yeah. The only other place that you can do that, if you're not a royal, do you know where that is? No. Uh, it's, it's going to be one of the colleges, isn't it? It, it is indeed. Is it Magdalen? Uh, no, it's St John's. St John's. Uh, okay. It's St John's because the royalist link to the college. It is always a glorious moment to anyone watching this presentation when you actually manage to catch Matt out on, on anything at all when it comes to these. Um, but my favourite tradition, I will move on after this, but I do think it kind of gives a bit of a sense to what we're actually playing with here. My favourite of all the traditions I've ever read was back in the 60s at mm -hmm. Oxford, where there, uh, where there was an undergrad at that time mm -hmm. who found a bit of university statute that said he was entitled to, and do you know this one? He was entitled to two, three pints of ale, as it is not beer, but ale, mm -hmm. every single day for the duration of his three year degree. Um, and the university uh, team had to acquiesce to that because it was true, it was there, it was in writing, uh, until the final day of his exams, when he turned up to his exams and he was duly met at the door and presented with a cheque for the price of the <laughs> ale over the past three years, for the very simple reason that he had not spent every single day for the past three years turning up uh, with a sword at his side, which was a very serious offence back in the 15th century when this statute was actually written down. Um, so it's, it, there's always a question of uh, be careful what you wish for with some of these things. But they are fascinating. And look, Oxbridge in general is a fascinating process. Last week we were talking about it's not always a good idea to talk about the top the top 20, the top 24, because that's so interchangeable in so many ways. But I think it's actually a very safe bet to actually refer to Oxford and Cambridge as the number one and number two of this country, because that is what they are. They are set apart in a league of their own, and they are looking for candidates to go into that particular bracket. So the way we would like to actually do this, and yes, we're going to have a chat over everything, but please do ask questions as we go. These sorts of things are always better when you actually ask the questions themselves. Um, and being that we are both here live, we can ask them as we go along, principally, because you're probably going to know a lot of this already. So here we go, uh, myself and Matt. Now, Matt, just we can do a shameless plug for him here, mm -hmm. also is the author of the Getting Into Oxford and Cambridge uh, Guide, has been for the last few editions of it as well, uh, and runs our very successful Oxbridge program here at MPW. I will try and use that as the last bit of salesmanship <laughs> that we put into it, but it does give a sense as to who the man is. The man, the myth, the legend himself. Um, right, so what we have is the Oxbridge environment that we'll look at first. It, Oxbridge is just a collective term, so don't let that trip you up straight away. You're just amalgamating two words together, Oxford and Cambridge, to come up with the Oxbridge process. Um, and very important to distinguish straight away, you can only apply to one out of the two. You can't apply to both of them. So it is about being selective as to which one you go to. And more importantly, knowing exactly why it is you want to go there, because that is the first step in the process, is knowing why it is. Not just knowing it because they're the best, but coming up with a far more detailed, far more intellectual, far more thought out answer than that. They are the most, uh, probably the oldest of the universities we have out there. So the eight, 900 years ago now, they're always occupying the top couple of league positions, certainly in this country and indeed globally as well. They are top five institutions, uh, along with some very other uh, esteemed universities mm -hmm. out there as well. But what they are is they are set in a slightly different bracket from everything else because they have a different structure to them too. They operate a collegiate structure, which means that uh, you're not just applying to the university, more specifically, you're applying to the college uh, in the first place as well. So they operate a collegiate structure. Oxford has more colleges than Cambridge, uh, 39 to 31 to be precise. And there's only one other university in the entire UK that operates around this system, and that's Durham. Durham. Yeah. Durham. Sir. When you chose Oxford, or oh, Cambridge, oh, sorry, you said Oxford, didn't you? It was Cambridge. It was Cambridge. There you go, I've got it wrong already. That shows <laughs> that I should be listening. But when you chose Cambridge over Oxford, Based on what? What was your rationale behind choosing that particular college? 
the advice of my teachers at the time, right. uh, because I was undecided between maths, computer science, philosophy, uh, and I, I, I ended up in fact applying originally for computer science. And Cambridge was at the time mm -hmm. uh, the had, had a greater reputation, and indeed Queen's College, the college to which I applied, was the place to apply to for computer science. Right. Um, so that's that was my teacher that gave me guidance there. And then I probably disappointed them by changing to philosophy. <laughs> well, and my there you go. That's an, that's but, but when, you, when you change from computer science to philosophy, it didn't change where you wanted to, no, to no, go. No, no, because Cambridge had uh, I mean, a fantastic reputation for philosophy as well. Mm -hmm. um, so you didn't play the strategy game with the colleges no. at that point? No, 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 not at all. Which is a really good point to be making, particularly early on in this presentation now, is a lot of the time people dwell too long on the strategy behind which college and numbers and stacks and all these. And yes, of course, with anything that you ever do, you should always adhere to a little bit of strategic planning. But I think the point that we, we want to make is don't dwell on that for too long, because at the end of the day, you're applying to Oxford and Cambridge to do the two prestigious universities that there are, yes, you might have a slight advantage if you go to one with a slightly smaller application pool, but at the same time, it doesn't change what they're actually mm. looking for. Indeed, and increasing numbers of students make, sorry, increasing number of successful students make open applications. Nice. The numbers are going up and up. Very good. So life is then organised around your college, which is why you need to make a, a good decision for you in your next three years in terms of where you can see yourself and what you want to be doing and drill down into everything there. Forget numbers for a second, but look at who's going to be teaching you. Uh, look at the others, make up the courses there, where more applicants apply in terms of the different courses, what sort of sense do you get for it, do you like the look of the building, uh, all of these sorts of sometimes quite fickle things, but try and work it out. It's like any university, you're shopping around a little bit, and this is the only bit of shopping you can actually do with the process, because it's the bit that's in your control and then it very quickly moves out of your control. But the main undergraduate teaching method is done by the tutorial and the supervision system, um, and that is then operated by your colleges themselves. Interesting fact for you, if you didn't know it already, this is why MPW is built the way it is. Uh, we were founded by three Cambridge graduates, and we are based upon this very tutorial uh, supervision style system. It is one of the reasons why our students do so well when it comes to the Oxbridge applications at times, but it is a methodology that came from founders when they were there and came over to us here uh, at this point. Do you remember supervisions? Do you remember tutorials? Do you remember oh, leading them? I do. I remember. Well, I remember starting off uh, in a group of about six. Yeah. Uh, which was which was quite nice because uh, you could fall quiet if you felt particularly mm -hmm. tired that morning uh, for whatever reason. Uh, by the third year, I, I was in a group of one with uh, one uh, professor. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you, know, you can't skip things. You can't be half asleep. And you know, there's, there's quite a lot of pressure at that stage uh, because. Uh, this, this professor in particular had a lot to do, uh, was, was mindful of writing a book at the time and really didn't want to discuss yeah. uh, Hume and the British empiricists with me. So I had to make it, you know, an extra special effort to, to be on my best game. Nice. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a great environment in which to learn. I mean, being, being in a group of one that is a little bit rare, but normally they try to keep it to at least two students. So mm. you've got a proper conversation between two students and a professor. Oh, uh, uh, or a conversation full stop yeah, if, exactly. if, with the second person. <laughs> but it, again, a really useful point to be bringing in here is when you're considering which applicants are going to survive at, uh, this sort of place, uh, thinking of who you have and who you might direct in that direction, or us, who we might direct in that direction, it is worthwhile reminding everyone that you never spoon fed when you go here. This is not that institution. You may find that you are going to be doing an awful lot of it yourself because there is an awful lot of uh, research going on around you, uh, which probably takes up more time than the actual uh, junior undergrads themselves. So, um, short terms, very heavy workload, um, which uh, is always is always a worthwhile point as well. Short terms often seem like the most attractive thing, but in those times you're working harder than anyone works at any other place. Um, so you really want dedicated students, you want driven students, you want people who are going to take the intellectual challenge behind it. And we'll look at the actual students uh, in a second. But uh, the greatest amount of focus within all of this is on that self-directed study. You'll spend a lot of time in the library, you'll spend a lot of time reading uh, and trying to assimilate all this information and basically coming back with questions for you to discuss. Uh, rather than going necessarily answering questions that are set for you. So it is about having that natural curiosity to, uh, to learn. 
Um, both universities are obviously very traditional, which means that they only offer the traditional based courses. Only in recent times has Cambridge roughly tried to join into the modern world with HSPS, which we'll talk about in a moment. But uh, in, in every other sense, it is a very traditional base of learning that you'll be having there. And one of the key distinguishing features among many will always be that what you can't do is cherry pick uh, modules from other courses. One of the great things about the university system as a whole in the UK is that you can enter in on one course and redefine what you're doing whilst you're there based upon the modules that you choose. So you can enter in on history, but you might want to pull in some modern language courses or an economics module or whatever it might be, and you change the focus and inflection of the actual degree course by the end of it. You can't do that at the Oxbridge system because you are wedded to what it is you actually start with. And they are very focused on the actual academic aspects as opposed to the practice of it. And the key ones we look at there are things like medicine and law specifically, because you are uh, looking at the academic intellectual side of the actual course itself and putting it into practice yourself. Whereas other courses, particularly medicine is a great example. Uh, medicine often starts in most places from a very practical aspect from the outset. But at Cambridge or Oxford, you actually have to start by learning mm. uh, the, the anatomy of it first. Um, stats, lies, damn lies and statistics. There you go. Everyone likes a good stat and there are very little uh, lies in the Oxbridge statistical system. Uh, it's one in seven, isn't it, for Oxbridge? Uh, yes, for one, Oxford, one, definitely. One in, seven, one in six. Yeah. One in seven, one in six, which is, is, is obviously a, a particularly competitive racy yeah. number uh, to have within all that. When you've got about 20, 25,000 applicants every year, You've got to be in the right place for it. But if you look at below at what actually is a successful candidate, and I come at this now from the recruitment aspect, when you see people at the GCSE stage coming in saying, look, I've got some sevens, some eights, some nines, and I really want to apply for Oxbridge, you always have to remind them that the average, and this is the average successful applicant, will always have around grade eights, grade nines, mostly grade nines, A stars coming out of GCSE, and that's just the beginning of the process. When you look at standard offers offered out by Oxbridge, sometimes there'll be A star AA for humanities, sometimes there'll be double A star A if you're looking into the sciences. But that doesn't mean that is what people get. People tend to over exceed the offers themselves. So if you look below, 2019 for Cambridge, 95% of those applicants obtained at least the A star AA. And at least is where putting it, because over half of those, 55%, scored the top grade in each and every one of those subjects. So having the grades is never enough. It's just a marking point to show you where you should be aiming towards, okay? It's a very sad indictment to the English system. And I say this again and again, but it benefits the English system as a whole, particularly A-levels and GCSEs and all that, benefits you if you know how to pass it. So everyone is actually going to be around this particular level. So what else? What else is it we're at? Is that a fair thing to say? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I'm, I'm not trying to dumb down the system because no, no. we want you all over here. We want yeah. you teaching it um, because actually it's a really good preparation for university, but it also benefits you if you understand the exam. So therefore, having the grades is never enough. And that's, I think, is a misconception a lot of people have out there in the world mm. to say that I am super smart. I am at the top of my uh, class and all these sorts of things, but the exams don't actually prove whether you're capable to cope at Oxbridge. They just prove that you're capable of doing well in a school exam. Mm -hmm. And school and the university is still worlds apart in terms of that jump, aren't they, in terms mm -hmm. of what you've got to do. And, and that particularly scene is at the Oxbridge stage. Um, I mean, we, we have a lot of experience in this, partly because of where we started. OK, or how we started. And we are set up to actually be able to give people more individualised focus. And I promise not to give you a sales pitch, and I'm not because this applies to schools or generally everywhere. You need to have a good mentor, someone to actually take you through it and someone to help you actually understand the differences, which is what we're trying to give you here today. Because like uh, Matt said early on, he got advice from his tutors as to which the best university and the best, best college was uh, for him. And some degrees at different universities are going to be slightly clearer than uh, the nuts, aren't they? I mean, an awful lot of people nowadays want to study economics. And if you want to study economics, well, you've got two distinct choices, haven't you? Uh, and most of the time, uh, people veer towards the PPE. You can only do PPE at Oxford, and that's the clearer specialism yes. for, for that. 
Whereas Cambridge, as I tried to say before, is, is bringing itself a little bit more into the, the modern world. And its most modern course, it's added to the rostra, um, is HSBS, mm -hmm. uh, which is the human, um, what is it, human social and political sciences, absolutely, uh, which brings in more of the international relations side of it, the social anthropology, the sociology subjects, which again give them a little bit more kudos at mm -hmm. A level now, too. But there are differences, and you really do just need someone to take you through it. And that's what we agree. That's our specialism as much as anything. Um, courses, they are broadly similar at both places, but there are nuances. There are subtle differences in the way, um, such as history. History will always be the one to veer towards there in terms of which university offers which specialism or law, which university is more focused on which criminal aspects. So subtle differences to actually have a look at, um, but that's where we're here to do. So look, that's the contextual overview to Oxbridge. Right. Have we missed anything in that? Is that basically no, giving the overview? Yeah. Basically, old fashioned, they do the traditions, they are oversubscribed, but that's a good thing because competition is healthy and it drives you. And it will therefore pick out the best applicants. Those best applicants are the ones who rise to the challenge. So what are they looking for? Matt? Go on, give us, give us the overview as to what the successful candidate is. Okay. Well, let, let me begin by uh, emphasizing the point that James made about two minutes ago, which is that uh, grades, good grades, the A star, AA, the A star, A star, A, are necessary. Uh, they're not sufficient. Uh, there are many, many people applying, as, as, as we saw from the statistics. And so the, the average uh, applicant can assume that everybody else is going to be getting the same excellent grades as them. Uh, so the grades are important. One of the things that, of course, uh, we can do here is uh, help people to achieve those grades. But uh, what Oxbridge require uh, is something else. Uh, and so here's a, a list of things uh, that students should be aware of uh, and those advising them should be aware of. And the first thing um, is the nature of the A-levels. James said again a moment ago that the school environment is a very different environment from uh, the university environment. A-levels were originally designed uh, for a different purpose. So they were designed to lead people up to a certain level. Uh, and it cannot be assumed that just because you've got a star, A star, A star at your A levels, that you will continue uh, on uh, that slope. That, that may be you, that may be where you finish. Um, so it, that, that is why they, they can't just take their, them into account by themselves. Mm. What they're looking for are students uh, who are uh, creative and curious and intellectually hungry. Um, they, they are really, really interested in their subject. Um, and that hopefully that shouldn't sound too platitudinous because one would hope that students go to university because they're really, really interested in, in, their, in their subject. But a lot of students will go because, yes, they're interested, but yes, they're good at it. And there's, there's nothing in a sense wrong with that. But Oxford and Cambridge really want to see students who are uh, profoundly curious. In those seminars, in those tutorials, uh, you will be expected to speak and to argue. You know, the professor will not want to sit there uh, conveying information to you. They will want you to argue with them. Um, and you've got to be able to think on your feet. You've got to be able to think creatively and incisively. Uh, you've got to be able to draw upon um, thoughts and ideas from different subjects. Uh, so, you know, for example, a historian should have a good sense of uh, what was happening uh, in economic theory or at the, at the time they're studying, or the literature at the time that they're studying, for example. It's not unheard of for for example, in a history interview for, the, you know, for one of the, um, the interviews to ask the candidate, uh, you know, what novels have you read recently and what do you think of a historical novel? Uh, and obviously one doesn't want the student at that point to say, well, I'm sorry, I studied history. I haven't read a, you know, a book since I gave up English literature, thank God, uh, when I was 16. So they're looking for people who are, what we might say, cross-disciplinary. Uh, yes, you have to go up to study a particular subject. And yes, when you walk into the library, the books will be nicely divided by topic area. But what they want you to see is that this is a formality. You should be interested in a whole range of subjects. Uh, you should be prepared to, to listen to uh, lectures, be they online or you know, in lecture halls, on different subjects uh, so that you can, uh, you can there's a sense of cross-pollination of your ideas there. Um, and one thing that will come out in the interview, one thing that they will expect you to produce in your essays and in those discussions that you will have uh, in the, the tutorials, is this idea of making connections. Uh, can we explain, for example, history in economic terms? And obviously, you know, sort of Marxist idea there. Um, 
But uh, thinking in those ways, not being wedded or boxed into your subjects is, is an absolutely key thing. And it's, it's, we, we often see that a lot from students, admittedly at the very early stages, so that we can work them out of it. When they're surprised to say, well, you know, why, why if I'm studying psychology, should I be interested in literature? Why if I'm studying history, should I, should I care about economics? Uh, in, and the answer is, well, because these things are all interwoven. That, that is the nature of the world. So in some, they're looking for students who are you know, really excited by their subject. They are moving beyond the A-level. Uh, you know, they, the kind of student who writes in their personal statement that what they've really enjoyed uh, are the following topics, and then they give a, a sort of best of, of you know, the syllabus uh, for, say, biology, chemistry, and physics. It's doing well, but, but they're not showing that they've got any, any, any real depth. I mean, they've had two years. Why have they not uh, researched and read beyond uh, what the A-level uh, confines them to? Isn't it always astonishing, though, how many students you actually get who decide that they want to go to Oxbridge, but they leave it right until mm. that last year in that A2 year, the final year of sick, where they suddenly go, I, I want to apply to Oxbridge, and you've got about six weeks to turn that around. Um, those are the people who never get very far with it. You don't have to have they known don't. since birth you want to go to Oxbridge. You don't have to have known since GCSE, but you'll have worked it out during your first year. And as Matt's saying, you will have worked out how to cross-pollinate. I love that phrase, by the way, cross-pollination uh, of, of all the things that you're actually doing. That, that, I mean, that's absolutely right. I mean, it really is important to try to identify and help students as, as early as possible. Um, I mean, we, we will be, I will be speaking to uh, our, our interested students in year 12 uh, this week and next week to see what thoughts they've had, to see what they're, they're reading, see what they're planning to do with the long summer ahead, because it will move quickly. Um, and in that personal statement, you have to uh, show off uh, a profound interest in your subject. And you can't cook that up in a few weeks, as Jonas says. You can, uh, you can list the novels that you've read or the, or the historians that you're interested in, but in six weeks, you won't have time to read things properly. And the admissions student will catch you out on that. Mm -hmm. So one has to get started early. Um, so it is, it's about you know, what we can do, obviously, is to, is to give students uh, an enormous amount of help in identifying material that will take them beyond the syllabus. And we have, as, as James said, many members of staff here who have studied, uh, be it a postgraduate or undergraduate level at Oxford, uh, who in some cases are even teaching there part time uh, at the moment. And so uh, you know, I'm fully aware of the kind of thing uh, that students can be recommended to do. Mm. Um, I, would, I would also just add into that as well. I mean, if, if we're not fortunate enough, to get uh, to get your students through here then one of the other great places you can be and i was having a look earlier on actually as well um per uh per subjects on the um, on the websites for oxford and cambridge they now publish the reading lists in terms of the advanced reading list and the year one reading list as well uh it doesn't mean exhaustively read them all i mean you, you might want to aim to do that if you are if you have the time, but certainly to get a good weight of that reading done within there, they are steering you in the right direction. It is a trick so often missed, isn't it? I mean, the LSE has, has often been famous for this in terms of actually telling you exactly what they want, but hiding it on their website so you've got to find it. It's almost like a test that you have to go through first. I mean, Oxford and Cambridge aren't quite that sneaky about it, but yeah. they're actually signposting exactly what it is that you should be reading. And that's what we go through with students. It's actually Firstly, making these signposts clearer. Mm. And secondly, actually saying, look, what actually is interesting for you on in that? And sometimes you're just encouraging students to dip into a book, to read it. If it's not working out for them, to then go on to another book and then actually move from it. But to actually see what is there in front of them. Is that a fair thing? But to absolutely. Yeah, to two things on that. And firstly, alongside the reading lists, uh, both universities are putting more and more lectures online as well. Mm. I mean, these are aimed uh, at all, at all sort of the general public, but, but it's a wonderful yeah. opportunity for students alongside the reading lists to, to follow uh, a lecture course on whatever topic it, it is that uh, may be of interest. And the second point following up from that is that what, what those reading lists are trying to do alongside giving you an impression of what comes next and how these subjects have an enormous amount of depth um, they're encouraging students to try to find things that they're interested in. The personal statement that the student will ultimately write, uh, I always suggest should be built around two or three ideas, two or three things that I'm interested in and have got me thinking. Um, and one can only find out about those things 
unless one is lucky enough to have had a fascination of something from, from a very young age, one can only find out about these things by reading around. As James says, you, know, you might be interested in history generally and find that the, you know, the history of the Tudors bores you to tears, because what you're really interested in is, is you know, the history of the Roman Empire. Well, that's fine. Um, that's what you can write about, and you know, that's what you can ultimately make a, a focus of your study. Um, but it takes time to do this, um, and we can accelerate that uh, by talking to students uh, and having a, a sort of mini tutorial in a sense, and saying, so what are you interested in, and then directing them to, to reading, and when we we'll be talking about tests shortly, uh, giving them advice on how to prepare best for the assessment test as well. The history of the Roman Empire, that was infinitely more interesting yeah. than the history of the Jews, absolutely. Yeah, a lot more blood, guts and... and blood, blood, guts and yeah. glorious <laughs> history, <Yeah>. absolutely. <laughs> Uh, so we have we have we have the academic staff uh, who are there to help students um, prepare intellectually. Um, some of whom will also be directors of studies, but the directors of studies uh, separately uh, will help the students uh, identify other features that they think worth uh, mentioning in their personal statements. And of course, they will write the references as well, which will draw upon the academic reports from the tutors, but also in that final paragraph of the reference, try to. Um, uh, celebrate, I was going to say sell, but let's elongate the word, celebrate the students and their unique attributes um, and uh, make them uh, really a very attractive option to the university and the college to which they're applying. How important is extracurricular in the grand scheme of an Oxbridge application? Uh, it's it's very important. I mean, they, they now have decided to call it supercurricular. I don't, supercurricular? <laughs> I, think, I think that's just because they want to encourage Latin and okay. so they want to you know, encourage this. I think they the reason for that, and it is a cosmetic change ultimately, um, I, I had to, when we were preparing the, the Trotman guide that James mentioned, I, mean, I always used extracurricular until, until I was corrected. Um, I think it, it stems from the concern that uh, for students not in, not in the independent sector, uh, it may be harder for them to do things as well outside of school. Mm -hmm. okay? But what they can do inside of school are things that are more advanced or super on top of what they're doing. So they, they now call it super curricular. Super curricular, extracurricular, call it what we like. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's very important if, if by that we mean intellectual activities. If we mean um, playing sports, uh, being in school play, getting your scouting badge for, for being able to light fires, that sort of thing, much less so. Is that what you were driving at that second bit? A, a, a little bit, yeah, yeah, because obviously the difference between writing a general yes. UCAS application and an Oxbridge one often tends to weed out the extracurricular. I listened to a podcast um, uh, some time ago now from uh, one of the Oxbridge admissions uh, team there who were basically saying, look, leave out anything to do with the extracurricular side of things because at the end of the day, um, university professors don't want to be reminded of all the things that they're not good at and don't have any interest in at all. You're actually trying to make a sales pitch to them intellectually. So it goes to this uh, super curricular, that's an interesting phrase, super curricular uh, idea that, yes. that we have there. I think, I, no, but that, that's, that's right. And if we can avail ourselves of both phrases, yes, what they want to see in, in that personal statement is evidence of the super curricular. I have gone beyond the syllabus. I am really interested. I do not just simply sit in class and get 100% in every test because I'm wonderful at, at assimilating information. That's good, uh, but again, maybe necessary, but it's not sufficient. Um, mm -hmm. The extracurricular, the sort of thing then that one does outside, which typically makes up the last paragraph, the last 20, 25% of a personal statement. And I, I've heard it regularly from admissions tutors or those that, that do outreach programs to advise schools that, in effect, the, the tutors stop reading after they've read the first 80%. As soon as there's a mention of that you running the bicycling club or you know or a tiddly weights tournament when you were 11 they say that's enough you know <laughs> we, i've read all that i need to read I'll, I'll now turn to the remaining 300 in the pile mm -hmm. um so yes it, it's good that it's there uh because you will be applying uh invariably applying to other universities as well but it's it's we, we have a sort of 80 20 rule when writing the personal statements 80 percent academic 20 percent extracurricular as we can now call it um so as part of that development, I mean, we've emphasised reading an awful lot, and that, that's, that's not just because we want to be traditionalist uh, or uh, they want to be traditionalist, but you know, they, they, the universities have had a concern, I mean, across the board, but in particular Oxford and Cambridge, understandably they've, be, they've become concerned that students, uh, thanks to the availability of information online, which is typically uh, broken up and made into digestible bite-sized bits, 
that attention span has decreased, that the, you know, the ability to sit and read a book, uh, which would be familiar to us all, um, has, uh, has declined. There are far fewer students who are able to do that. And um, uh, they're, they're not going to uh, give up on that. They're not going to say it can all be done through TED Talks and online lectures and all the rest of it. You know, they, they really do want you to get knee deep in, into books, although it very much learn the skill that James mentioned earlier of understanding how to read a book, which is not necessarily reading every page slowly, but skimming through, finding the relevant bit and gutting it, as one of uh, you know, uh, my professors used to say, to find the relevant bits. Um, so whilst there is always, and there will always be a huge emphasis put upon reading, especially in the humanities, um, it is also important, that one thing that we're able to doing here is to encourage students uh, to find other avenues for learning, uh, so visiting galleries, uh, going to talks, uh, listening to podcasts, participating in essay competitions, participating in summer schools, festivals of ideas, and something that came just come up with. All sorts of things that one can do to find out more, and certainly with things like the summer schools, to, to participate with, with like-minded students. My One of the things that really, if I mentioned the one, so my wife wasn't applying to Oxford to do classics. It was, it was a summer school where you know, she got to do a sort of head start course in Greek and you know, met people that, that were as interested as she was. And, and that was a wonderful thing. Very good indeed. I, um, I often get people sort of saying, and there's a lot of bad advice out there as well, actually, in terms of, is watching documentaries useful? Is it helpful? And there's obviously two schools of thought to that. I mean, on the one hand, people say, no, of course not. It's more important to read and all those sort of things. And then what you have to remind people is that a lot of the time, OK, documentaries are made for TV, they're made for entertainment purposes and all that. But they are also made by university professors. Mm. They are the people who are doing the research. You want to get it out there. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, it's probably not the right way of saying this, but there's a good amount of ego that goes to uh, the professorship at uh, a lot of universities, mm -hmm. particularly Oxford. And so to play to that ego a little bit is uh, is always a, is not a bad thing. But to watch some of these documentaries, to hear it, you had a picture of Mary Beard on there mm -hmm. before as well. I mean, all of her work that she did on TV, it introduces the subject, it introduces ideas. So the idea is not that watching TV is bad. It's where those ideas then take you, isn't it? So watch it, then go and read more about what Mary Beard said, or then tie in those ideas into something else. But using modern uh, avenues is a good thing as well. It doesn't just have to be wedded to the book, no. but find the impetus wherever that impetus comes from. So don't listen to people if they say, no, just don't do that sort of thing. That's nonsense. Try and remember where things actually came from in the first place. Yeah, the, 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 the programs of Mary Beard, where they have those computer Regenerations of Rome. I mean, the fact that you might can convey in a couple of images there is wonderful. Mm -hmm. and similarly, Brian Cox talking about the planets, or David Attenborough mm -hmm. with ever so many series. Uh, they're, they're wonderful things. They, they complement perfectly the sorts of things that one can find in books. Um, the, the emphasis is not just on books, uh, but uh, it, they, they do want students who, who can do what we might, what we today would call slow learning. This business of sitting down, cup of coffee. That not just hoping for the digested form, putting the phone to one side and, and, and reading through them. Absolutely. Which is, which is an art. I mean, it's, it's an art for everybody, but yeah. particularly so in the modern age. Questioning what's in front of you, never mm -hmm. just taking something at face value and going, this must be real because, I mean, uh, Vikings, the historical mm -hmm. history channel, which was then taken up by every sort of leading uh, film studio and all that from mm -hmm. there, had University of, uh, of Cambridge professors working on it because the ASNC course and all that. Mm -hmm. So they were advising on it, but it doesn't mean you sit there, you watch it and go, this must be true yeah. because the professor has guided that this is the right answer. It's then questioning and going, is that the case? And then going off and really pushing that questioning because with as with everything, facts can be, uh, can be taken on. Shall we go to uh, how we distinguish the pilot? Um, so those are people, those are what happens in the personal statements and the assessments and those sorts of, um, sorry, in terms of the original application. Then we move to the assessment side of things, which is separating the wheat from the chaff, I suppose. Yes. At that point. Um, there was a period of time in the late 80s, 90s, when Oxford and Cambridge largely depended upon uh, O-level GCC results, AS and A-level results. Uh, but in the last 10, 15 years, both universities have reintroduced pretty much across the board uh, some form of additional assessment uh, to determine whether a candidate is a good candidate uh, for uh, entry. Um, it's important to mention that when it, when it comes to deciding 
to which can which candidates should be made offers. Um, the universities say, and I have no reason to disbelieve them, that they take everything into account. So it's not as if the uh, the predicted grades or the A-level grades are the determinant for whether you get um, an assessment, and the assessment determines whether you get an interview. They they will look at everything. Uh, a really really good interview can offset a slightly underwhelming performance in an admissions assessment, and vice versa. But nevertheless, for most courses, there will be some kind of admissions assessment, and therefore it's important to prepare for them. Mm. Uh, and the, the idea behind an admissions assessment, having just said that, is they're not things that one can prepare for in the normal way. There's, there's not a syllabus. It's not like an old-fashioned S level, if you remember those things, where there's additional material to be learned uh, that will test students. Um, the idea is that students from whatever school they, they happen to be in can attempt them because they are, as far as possible, trying to test the students' sort of native wit as uh, culture within, within the context of the subject. Um, so as to put nobody at a disadvantage. With that said, uh, as with any kind of such test, one can uh, prepare for them by looking at past papers. And, and, and Oxford and Cambridge do make uh, lots and lots of past papers available online so that students can have a look at them. And even kindly, in many cases, publish an answer key and explanation. So that, you know, a lot of the, mis the mystique has gone out of it these days. Um, uh, but like, like with a lot of things, that there's, there's a knack, there's a skill to seeing how some of the questions work. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have a lot of experience in helping people uh, do that. Um, shall we have a look at a question? Let's have a go. Right. Um, practical time, because it is important, as we always say, that you get involved and you think like a student. So, look, uh, let's have a look at a question. See if you can answer it yourselves within all of this. Um, and then, obviously, we have uh, Matt to explain it to us, because uh, he knows it inside out and back to front. So, see what you do, what you can make of, of, of this. Usually, how long do they have for a question? Well, I think minute. you've probably got about a minute to 90 seconds. Okay, a minute to 90 seconds on the clock. And that brings us into the last sort of five, 10 minutes of the presentation anyway. It's time for you to ask some questions at the end of it. So, we'll go quiet just for the remaining 30 seconds for you. Once you have the answer, put it into the message uh, tracking. We won't pick on you. We won't even uh, we won't even um, identify if you get it wrong. Um, just what is it? A, B, C, D, or E? Who's got what? This is the time. Right? You always wonder who's going to go first. Who's going to go first? Who feels brave? Anyone feeling particularly brave? Or are we all slightly concerned that we won't get a place at Oxbridge if we uh, if we get this one wrong? Because uh, I'm here to tell you, chaps, uh, your Oxbridge interview is not riding on this particular question right now. So um, what have we got? Well, what do you think? Uh, all, all jokes aside on this, what, what do we think? Well, while people feel brave now, why don't you talk us through the whole thing? Okay, let us let's put this up here. We can put the answer up there and we have a little explanation. The, the, the answer is B. Hopefully, you're all now going to see B appearing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's what I B said. Through, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the question it, it's, it's a fairly simple maths question, um, but the trick is to, to read it all the way through. It's, it's uh, what they're asking you for is you know, how many more laps will one person have completed rather than another? when they all cross you know, the start line together. So it's easy to work out you know, how, how long it will take them to all cross the line together. That's the late least common multiple of three, five and six, which is 30. But then you've got that little second stage. So a lot of people put down the wrong answer there. After 30 minutes, Alex will complete the 10 laps, running at three, uh, three minutes a lap, Barry six and call in five. So it's the difference between 10 and six. There's no, the math is not complicated there, but you're doing a lot of questions very quickly. I was going to say, is it fair to say in the TSA? It's a bit like uh, things like the UCAP for medicine, mm -hmm. isn't it? Sometimes things are not as complicated as they seem. It's just the speed in which you have to actually complete yes. them that catches a lot of people out. 
So this is where the actual practice side of things come in, not so much for anything other than the speed of which you're answering exactly. questions within. And it's also important to be, be aware that uh, you know, they, they do put a lot of questions up. There's not an expectation that you will complete all of them. Yeah. It's, it's an exercise in learning to, to manage yourself, not to get in, into a fluster. It's very easy to do when you see pages and pages of these questions. Uh, but um, once you've seen a few of them, you know, there, there are some regular styles of questions, some, some math, some visual, you know, visual spatial questions. There's ones where you have to imagine sort of turning a die mm. in, in your mind's eye, seeing what's on the other side. One can practice them to a degree. Do you want to give us a sense of some of the other types of questions, and then we'll just have a look at the interview at the end? So we put up the, the TSA, first of all, that's called the Thinking Skilled Assessment, and the reason we did that is because that is a test that many courses use to, to assess general intellectual ability. Some of the questions are mathematical. There's another one, uh, for example, where you know, you're given uh, some instructions on uh, the, the red and white areas coloured of a flag, and you have to try to work out um, the, uh, the, the, the ratio of areas coloured red and white. And the idea is not to be distracted by irrelevant detail. That, that, that is a complicated shape. Okay? I mean, there's no way mathematically that you could uh, work out any kind of curve there. So you need to disregard that and just read the, the instructions on the left hand side uh, and just think of it in, simple, in terms of simple numbers, um, which I've you know, put out there. Uh, there's no mention of the shape of the flag there, for example. That would be another kind of one. A, a very different one uh, would be um, for modern languages. Uh, they're not looking uh, to determine that you are a fluent speaker in French or Polish, for example, should you wish to apply for these subjects, because um, you can do a lot of that when you're there. What they're, lo they're looking for are students who've got you know, a real understanding of the idea of language, how grammar works, um, the nuances of language, just to say nothing of you know, the culture and so on and so forth. So a question like this, for example, explain how uh, a sentence is ambiguous. So if we take the first one, Danny Rose just got flattened by the touchline. Any ideas? How that's ambiguous, how we could read that in two ways? Me? Yeah, I couldn't change that spot here. This is, this is an unrehearsed thing. Well, it is, because that's one of those times where I was, I was watching the rain come down. <laughs> Following sentences are ambiguous, briefly explain the ambiguity. Um, uh, flattens is ambiguous, isn't it, in terms of what does that actually mm -hmm. mean, in terms of that? Um, I mean, can you actually argue the touchline is a bit ambiguous in terms of where you are? What is that? How can a touchline flatten someone? That's sort of thing. Who flattened? Who is there another exactly. person involved? That's the one. So am, I, am I roughly getting into roughly, Oxbridge right, here? Exactly. <laughs> it could be Danny Rose got flattened. The touchline is the thing that flattened Danny Rose, as you said. Okay. Or it could be that somebody else flattened Danny Rose just by the touchline. Phew. There you go. So I will put you through the other one. No, no, please. Okay. But one thing while we talk about modern language, just to say, if you have modern language as part of your A-level combination, there's a, a, a nice little bit of information coming out of Oxbridge last year that said that people who have a language in their combination, uh, generally speaking for most sorts of courses, uh, they, they had a slightly higher ratio of people uh, being accepted who had at least one language in their combination because languages are so unsubscribed mm -hmm. at A level that it gives people a natural advantage from the skills that learning a language actually uh, gives you. So a little bit of uh, insider trading at GCSE stage, encourage your students if they can to keep going with languages for Absolutely. as long as possible. I, do, I think it was UCL in London who either still have or did have at one point a requirement uh, that all students had to have studied, all applicants had to have studied at least one language at GCSE. Okay. Uh, I think they've dropped that now, but I think th th there was a real pressure uh, to both because they thought language was academically good and important for survival, uh, to make it actually you know, a, a, a requirement. Um, so, I was going to say, so uh, what we have, we have about five minutes left, so should we have a look at the, uh, the interview side of yeah. things um, as well? So the, um, just on the TSA and all the uh, specific entrance tests, depending on the course you do at the university you go for, that is something that we can provide further advice to, but always is a good idea to look on the websites and actually work out what the course involves from the outset before actually deciding that that's what you want to go towards. But then once we've been through all of that, you have the world famous Oxbridge interviews. Um, over to you, Matt. Um, the, yeah, the interview is something, uh, again, that is, that is shrouded in, in uh, mystery and, and tall tales. I mean, the story I was told um, when I uh, was going up for interview was 
but um, the, the following question might be the answer to the following request that we made. One of the admissions tutors would hand you a brick and say, please throw this brick through the window. You turn around a particularly ancient mullioned window, <laughs> uh, you know, dating back eight centuries. Um, and uh, were you to throw the brick through the window and ruin it, if you'd fail, were you to open the window first and then throw the brick through, you'd, you'd be interrupted with a fake uh, Needless to say, this is rubbish. So, so, so how many uh, times could you get that one? Exactly. <laughs> it takes uh, one person to get it wrong. <laughs> but, but there are always stories of, uh, like, like that. Um, the fact is that the interview will, or interviews, uh, depending on how many you get, um, Oxford will tend to give you more than Cambridge. Uh, the interview will uh, is an occasion for you to have a conversation uh, with two uh, academics, and uh, it really is an opportunity for you to enjoy yourself by talking to intelligent people about ideas. It, it isn't meant to be a scary thing, and the, the interviews will not be scary. They, they, they very much want to get the best people, uh, the people who can uh, spend an hour or two each week talking to them, uh, not, you know, not sitting there mutely or passively, but are enjoying themselves and, and, and who are engaged. They're not expecting students to come along with all the answers. Uh, what they're looking for is for students to, uh, for the kind of students who's got um, uh, what we might call a, uh, a midpoint or you know, can maintain a balance between, on the one hand, when they're challenged, uh, giving up, simply folding their cards and not, not arguing whenever somebody argues against them, and on the other side, being dogmatic and stubborn. Mm -hmm. uh, they're looking for somebody who can argue their point, but should they be uh, shown, should, should, should their position shown to have problems, which is almost certainly going to be the case when you're faced with two academics in, in your area of expertise, um, that you can move back, you can see the fault, you can think on your feet, you can come up with some new ideas. So, uh, you know, classic question in you know, philosophy interview is about personal identity. If all the cells in your body today are different than they were when you were eight, sure you're a different person. The intuition is no, I'm not, but you know, what makes you the same person? Uh, and uh, I, I, this is one when I do mock interviews with philosophy, and we have a lot of fun with, uh, and good students will, will look around and say, well, perhaps I'm the same person because of my memories or my, my attitudes or my, my beliefs or because I belong to the same family. And uh, you know, the fun is picking holes in all of these, these things because. It's like in so many philosophical questions, it's an unsettled thing. And what we're looking for are students who can, who can enjoy the back and forth. And that, that's what they're looking for. They're, they're looking for somebody excited, uh, discursive, uh, and who can think on their feet. Not somebody who knows it all, and not somebody who simply wants to go there simply to learn in the class as well. Lovely. I think it's, it's Look, I mean, with, with five minutes left, um, and we promised ourselves we, we'd rattle through this in half an hour and we'd give you all the time in the world to ask uh, Matt any questions. But um, with five minutes to go, uh, does anyone actually have any questions that they would like to uh, think you know, that they would like to, to ask uh, that we can ask for you right now? On the Oxbridge process itself, uh, what the uh, what people are looking for. Uh, anything that we didn't clarify for you at this stage? So anyone at all? Uh, you can either unmute or you can um, or you can join the message chat. Steve, welcome back. I'm I'm here. Yes, I, I always have questions, but I, I always like to give other people the chance uh, yeah. in, in case they do. Um, let Let's see if any questions come through. Um, mine, Matt. I'm sure it's for you, really, but. You know, when parents and children and the students come in and they've got these Oxbridge aspirations, um, how, how do you get them to reality? I mean, if they really aren't an Oxbridge candidate, how, how do you break that to them? Or do you see potential in them that they don't see themselves? How, how does it work at the advice stage? Well, the very first thing I say to any Oxbridge candidate, uh, be they with their parents or not, is the question you should ask yourself is not, um, uh, is, uh, it's, uh, am I right for Oxford, but whether it's, it's right for me. Um, and the reason I say that is because what's distinctive uh, about it is, is the learning style, the, the high pressure short term environment, the focus on independent learning. Um, and it, it's not for everybody, and it not being for everybody doesn't mean that uh, should you go elsewhere, 
that you will be going somewhere that is second rent. If you think, for example, of our many wonderful Russell Group universities, you will have access to professors and fellows at the same degree of academic excellence, students uh, who are just as interested. Um, it will be it will simply be the case that your, your workload is structured in a different way. And that will often suit a lot of students for whom the question that you write for Oxbridge you know, comes up, you know, what, what the parent or what the student is thinking is, you know, I, I, I'm bright, I've, I've got good A-levels, but you know, I, I find the idea of doing all of this at a healthy scale to speak really not for me. And then the conversation becomes one which is, well, look, there's no reason to think that, that you're, you're settling for something less. I mean, in my experience, um, I've had, in my relatively short time at MPW, I've had two students uh, to whom I taught philosophy, both of whom turned down offers from Cambridge to study philosophy, and both of whom went to Edinburgh. And their choice was entirely motivated uh, by the learning environment. They, they wanted more time, they wanted a different structure. They're both brilliant students, um, but they didn't want that. So one way the conversation can go is to say, well, you know, perhaps the misgivings or the concerns you've got here, are, it's just not going to be the right environment for you. And you shouldn't worry about that. I mean, should you should you decide when you've, you've got your first degree from Edinburgh or whatever, you can always become a postgraduate at a lot of them, which should, should that appeal to you. Um, uh, should it be that the student um, uh, doesn't have the, uh, what we might call the sort of depth of interest, uh, leaving aside the qualifications, then uh, if we meet the student early on, then we can start them reading things and looking into things and seeing if they catch fire, uh, and then we can take it from there. Um, if that's not the case, then yeah, ultimately one does have to be frank with the students and say, and the parents and say, look, there are you could you could write it out this year and apply with your grades next year. You could, um, uh, as I say, pursue a post postgraduate course should you want to go there. But you shouldn't you shouldn't think it's the be all and end all of everything. It is, it is special, it is different, uh, but it's not that you're going to be settling for something that is decidedly second rate. Steve, can I just add in on that? Um, one of the things that's so tediously obvious still nowadays is that Oxbridge is a parental-led process. Um, and so the importance for us as much as anything is to get the parents out of the conversation and let people like Matt then work with the students to actually work out whether they want to go there and whether they have the ability to go there. Because from an admissions point of view, when you're actually talking parents and parents saying they're Oxbridge material and this, that and the other, it's always the parent, it's never the student. And that is... I, I say it's tedious because it is tedious, not because I'm dismissive of parents, but parents want to always encourage and push and do all these sorts of things, but they need to be taken out of the picture, just so that Oxbridge becomes a pure student-led process. Uh, I think we have a question uh, from uh, a hand up, a raised hand, Luigi. Hi, hi, Jason. Um, a question: There is any kind of uh, I'm uh, by the way, I'm a uh, Carlotta's father as a student at NPW. Is there any? Uh, uh, I wasn't being rude to you then, sir, as a, as a parent in the process. I realized the irony of you asking the question immediately after my rant, so I apologize. <laughs> That's okay, no problem. No, it's just a it's just a kind of a preferred uh, one of the two between humanities and sciences. I mean, like I don't know, is uh, uh, Oxford or Cambridge are better for law or philosophy, and or vice versa? Uh, historically, there were uh, differences. Uh, Historically, for example, uh, Cambridge was considered you know, the place to go for the sciences and mathematics, and, and Oxford for humanities. Um, I think I mean, these things these things have long gone. Trinity College Cambridge still has a certain reputation for maths. King's College Cambridge for English, uh, you know, University College Oxford for classics and these sorts of things. Um, but really. Uh, one should not think in, in, in those terms. I mean, both universities will offer uh, very similar courses in, in, in a wide range of subjects, and, and your you know, your choice should be informed uh, largely by other factors, whether you like the look of Oxford versus Cambridge. Um, the exceptions, as James mentioned earlier, are where there are very specific courses, like the famous PPE at Oxford, where you know, there, there's nothing analogous to that at Cambridge. Uh, or should you wish to do, and I, I strongly encourage people in this direction because you know, my, my grandfather's passion, if you want to do Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic, it's a very good course, not the most practical course on offer, but it's still a good course. That's something you can only do at Cambridge. Um, but, it, but it doesn't really boil down to this university is good for this, this university is good for that, not anymore. Okay, 
Okay, good. Thank you. By the way, you know, uh, James, I totally agree with you. All parents should be out of relations between school and students. 100%. <laughs> Thank you. We, we, we do like the involvement of parents throughout the course of their study here and all that. But when it comes to the future, mm. that's where the people are only ever going to be happy if they are actually speaking for themselves. So I appreciate your support there, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I, I, you know, I didn't have the camera on. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, especially here in Italy. I mean, you know, parents are incredibly in the relations between school and students, which is absolutely wrong. Definitely, yes. Okay, good. Thank you, by the way, for the answer. That's okay. Any other questions that we can answer for? Or otherwise, uh, over to Mr. Phillips. I can't see any other hands or, or, or questions. And it, it's well, hopefully that's because it was exhaustive as opposed to exhausting <laughs> and uh, we've given all the answers. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you, James. That was really informative. And uh, yeah, great to great to see you both in the school again. And uh, good luck with all the, uh, the classes and everything going on. Um, we will. We'll catch up soon and, and thank you everyone for joining us today um it is recorded as we say and we'll we'll pass that on to you that all those who registered um to be able to watch it at your leisure and hopefully see you next wednesday for the next mpw live session all the best everyone all the very best thanks very much bye-bye